Shalom, and welcome to Friends of Israel's Canada's first annual What in the World is Going On online conference. My name is Jared Esser, and I'm so glad that you are joining us here today. What in the world is going on? So many people here in Canada or worldwide are asking that very question today. COVID has shaped our social, economic, and spiritual lives these past few years. Social uprisings, wars, and rumors of wars. People are looking for answers. We here at this conference hope that we can provide you these answers and guide you just towards what the Bible says to provide you a biblical lens to look through and discern what our times are telling us. We here at Friends of Israel Canada also provide weekly uh, videos on YouTube and Rumble uh, with news surrounding Israel and solid Bible teaching that can also support you and help you in trying to figure out what in the world is going on. We hope that these messages and this conference will strengthen uh, your walk with God and to show that He is in full control of these chaotic and fast times. We also pray and hope that any unbelievers that see these messages will be convicted and that they will go to the Lord and look into the Bible and find the precious gospel hope there. So, we ask that you please share this message if you enjoy it so that it can be a blessing uh, to all those around you, to your family, to friends, to all those who need to, who are asking this question, what in the world is going on? So for our first speaker of the day, I want to introduce you to Steve Herzig. He is Friends of Israel's North American director, he has been with, and he has been with Friends of Israel for over 40 years. He has been a contributor for Israel My Glory, he's a Bible college lecturer and author of many books. In 2021, in our conference then, he preached a message called, What Now?, where he focused on what was happening in 2021 and everything then. Today he'll continue with this theme with his message titled, Where Do We Go From Here? Enjoy. Hey, what a great opportunity. Thank you so much for letting me come into your phone, your computer, or however you're watching. Uh, what in the world is going on? That's kind of the big theme of what we're going to be talking about during this virtual conference. And I'm the first message, which, where do we go from here? You know, uh, we live in a world today where we can see the stage being set for really the tribulation period, the second coming of Christ, the millennial kingdom, and, which a thousand years, and then the new heaven and the new earth. We can see things being set already. It's an amazing thing. In fact, in Luke, in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 21 and verse 28, it says, now when these things begin to happen, now in Luke chapter 21, Jesus is talking about the tribulation period, that period of time, uh, the 70th week of Daniel. And that's the specific time period. But I think we can apply that when we see these things. What things? Well, I'm going to talk about them. There are actually five of them. But Jesus says, when we see these things begin to happen, look up, lift up your heads, because your redemption draws nigh. I want to be an encouragement to you today as you're listening to this, because we need to be about the Father's business. And there are five uh, world conditions, I think, that are help setting the stage for what the future will be. You know, it's interesting to me as we think about, uh, well, let me just start by telling you a story. I like to tell stories. Jewish people like to tell stories. Story of a young boy who goes to bed at eight o'clock, has a grandfather's clock that chimes every hour. So he hears the eight chimes, he falls asleep, he wakes up, still in the middle of the night, and he hears the grandfather's clock go off and he looks at his clock watch and he says, oh, it's, it's 12. So he listens one, two, it gets up to 10, 11, 12. And then it strikes 13, 13 o'clock. Wait a minute. He gets up out of bed. He runs around the house and he says, wake up everybody. It's later 
than you think. It is later than we think as we think today of the conditions in which we live. I'd like to center on five specific conditions that I see as reason for us to look up our redemption draws nigh. The first one, the first world condition, and it's going to sound strange because it concerns the Western nations, and that is accepting despots. Accepting despots. I, I got this in Primus from Hillsdale College, and I got it last year in November of 2021, and Larry Arn, who's the president of Hillsdale College, he wrote this. The title is The Way Out. And he asked two questions, two central questions. The first, how would you reduce the greatest free republic in history to despotism in a short time? That's an interesting question to even ask. Thinking here in context of the United States, the great republic, are we becoming a nation ruled by a despot? It almost seems like it. But a second question is, how would you stop that from happening? It's a, it's a great article, and it's detailed. I encourage you to go online and look it up and see if you agree with him. But in thinking of despotism, I thought to myself, wait a minute. There are some things that have happened. Look over the last two years. Over the last two years, we've seen COVID affect the free world. In my country, the United States, we have had different states handle it different ways to the point where some are virtually locked up in their own house. Uh, around the world, whether it's Australia, Canada, New Zealand, where they needed a green pass uh, that showed that they were vaxxed. Otherwise, they couldn't go anywhere. And in some cases, they couldn't go anywhere anyway because they felt in order to protect their people, they must lock them up. It's interesting to see unprecedented removal of freedoms that uh, were cherished by the West being dented, attacked. And it's, it's striking to me as we stage a period of time in Earth's history, and it will happen when a Antichrist will align who will be the chief of all despots. A second example of demonstrating this kind of power happened in Canada. And I'm reading from an article from a foreign policy, and it concerned the Emergencies Act. If you remember the truckers uh, from around Canada journeyed to Ottawa to protest COVID-19 uh, restrictions, the government responded with what's called the Emergencies Act, where uh, Justin Trudeau elicited these things. And it, ha it hadn't happened under this particular law in the history of Canada, but it really was renamed. There was a original law that was called the War Measures Act. That came in 1914, and that was used on three occasions. It was used in World War I, it was used in World War II, and in 1970, there was a separatist movement that Pierre Trudeau crushed. This, uh, these Emergency Act by Justin Trudeau actually was able to take uh, uh, monies, monies that were uh, in GoFundMe platform, about $8 million, and freeze them. Uh, there was one lady who uh, gave $50 to the truckers. She just saw a thing on TV and gave $50 because uh, she thought what they were doing was worth it in terms of a protest. And they froze all her funds. No one could stop them. The, this legislation, and for the period of time, only about two or three weeks that it went on, but it was an example of despotism, of a, of a free nation living under tyranny for a short period of time. That's, that's scary. So we have the Emergencies Act. We have the way COVID uh, was, was implemented. And then this Bill C-4. Bill C-4 is a 
uh, a law that was passed in December of, uh, of December 7th in 2021. And it passed uh, against what's called conversion therapy. The concern of this legislation can possibly forbid a person from reading scripture verses, uh, which would be considered hate speech in Canada, uh, to someone who might even want it. Uh, for instance, um, you have the Bible verse in Genesis chapter 1 that would read this way. God created man in his own image, and in the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Well, in light of the movement of uh, gender and multiple genders and multiple ways to practice your lifestyle, the idea of reading a Bible verse could actually be against the law and you could be thrown into prison. In fact, uh, reading a verse like from Galatians chapter 5, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Preaching self-control could be, possibly, a violation of this conversion therapy because you're limiting people from expressing their own sexuality. The idea of saying that there's one man and one woman in marriage, and the only way from a biblical point of view to express their sexuality can be considered breaking this law. So, you think of despotism, the laws that are passed in a free world, if you will, a free country like Canada. In the United States, in Loudoun County, Virginia, school boards, without notifying parents of the kind of curriculum that they were teaching, which might go against what the parents want. In fact, the governor, uh, governor's race in Virginia, the candidate who ultimately lost, was saying that parents should not be involved uh, in the choosing of the curriculum of a school. Uh, thank God the, uh, he lost the election. But nonetheless, the idea of a movement to accept this kind of authority is really almost unprecedented in the free world. Whether it's the United States or Canada or Australia or New Zealand, we're seeing a staging, if you will, as we like sheep fall into place concerning what can be crushing kinds of legislation or orders. It's interesting to me to watch this and to see how it's being accepted till ultimately when the Antichrist, who is the chief despot of all, will rule over a ten-nation confederacy. The second uh, world condition, the second of five, is alignments that are being made. What do I mean by that? Well, alignments in the Bible, we can go to Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39, and when we see Ezekiel 38 and 39, we see that there is a group of nations headed by what we believe is Russia, Gog of the land of Magog, Prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. Ezekiel is told to set his face against them and say that the Lord is against you. And when we think of this, we look at these nations that are going to go against Israel. The Bible says that God is going to put hooks in their jaws, hooks in their jaws to draw them down. And who are these nations? Well, Persia is Iran. We have Russia. We have Sudan, which is Ethiopia, Libya, Gomer, which is Turkey, Tagarma, which is another part of Turkey. And these nations are going to take a spoil against Israel. And what, what could that spoil be? Oh, it could be the Dead Sea, which has chemicals that are valued in the multi-millions. It could be the 
uh, vast uh, startup nations uh, that Israel has, the tech that it has, the brain, if you will, to go down and attack and, and take over the country. It could be as simple as anti-Semitism, uh, the hatred of the Jewish people, which has been ever since uh, God chose them as a special people. There's always been the Hamans of the world as we read the book of Esther. So you have this, al these, this alignment that takes place. Uh, these nations attack Israel. Interesting that a war is going on as I'm giving this message, a war that Russia has attacked Ukraine. Uh, as a result of this attack, there's 10 million refugees. Israel's preparing right now 75,000 uh, uh, people, Jewish people, for Aliyah to ascend. Aliyah is to ascend, to go up to Jerusalem. And because of this tremendous uh, terror, this war, uh, the amount of refugees, there is a movement of where God had his people, diaspora, to go back to the land. So the other alignment happened just a relatively short time ago in March. Uh, President Biden gave a speech uh, at the Business Roundtable in which he announced a new world order. Isn't it interesting as you read the book of Revelation, as you read about the Antichrist and a ten-nation confederacy, this alignment, this could be the pre-alignment of what ultimately takes place in the book of Revelation. So these alignments that are being made uh, could be this, this war uh, that will take place in Ezekiel and uh, other nations that become part of this new world order. So accepting despots, alignments that are made, aliyah to Israel. You know, every time there's been a major aliyah to Israel, it's been because of anti-Semitism. Uh, the Jewish people from the Ukraine are leaving, not specifically because of hatred against Jews, although that certainly ha has happened. It's because of this war. Um, there's 5.5 million American Jews. There are 400,000 Jewish people in Canada, Canadian citizens. And from time to time, 1,000, 2,000 might leave it in a given year to make Aliyah. But if the Lord tarries, I believe there'll be a mass Aliyah from North America simply because of anti-Semitism. And you might think that can't happen, but that's my fourth point. It is happening. Anti-Semitism is on the increase. We're finding that to be the case. There's an article put forth by France 24, and it's telling us that an average of more than 10 anti-Semitic incidents occurred around the world, a 10-year high in 2021. Imagine that. A 10 anti-Semitic incidents that happen around the world uh, every single day. No, anti-Semitism is on the rise. It's on the rise in France, where people are afraid, men are afraid to put on their kippah, their yarmulke, to be identified publicly as a Jewish person. There have been attacks uh, because of that. Uh, in Canada, numerous articles around the provinces, not in any one area, completely around uh, the whole country where anti-Semitic uh, anti events have taken place. And in the United States, it's up 70%. 70% of hate crimes in 2021 were anti-Semitic hate crimes. So as we, we see despotism accepted or more accepting, alignments that are being made, a new world order, uh, Russia asserting its power, more aliyah that is happening, anti-Semitism increasing, and finally the fifth, the fifth world condition, and this concerns you and me inside the church. Why do I say that? Well, in Titus, in Titus chapter 1, 
and starting in verse 10, follow along with me. For there are many insubordinate, both idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision. So Paul's writing Titus, and he's saying, I want you to beware Jewish people, unsaved Jewish people, are inside the church causing havoc, enemies, unbelievers against believers. And he's saying, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole household, teaching them things which they ought not. There are all kinds of teachings in the church today, all kinds of different teachings, subverting families. Uh, you can read about the church, and I'm not necessarily talking about believing church, those who believe, but in an organized church setting, uh, compromising uh, biblical standards in so many ways. In verse 13, it says, This testimony is true, therefore rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith. One of the reasons we have this virtual conference is to proclaim truth, to be sound in the faith. We at Friends of Israel have a little booklet, What We Believe. Uh, it was in Israel My Glory magazine, now it's in a booklet. You might want to investigate it by going to foi.org and searching it out and getting a copy. We believe that in sound doctrine and tell you what it is we at Friends of Israel believe. Well, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, Paul's writing to Timothy. He wrote to Titus, now he's writing to uh, the book right before, he's writing to Timothy, but know this, that in the last days, I think we're living in the last days, perilous times will come. We're living in perilous times. Listen to the description of perilous, perilous times. Men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Certainly your mind doesn't have to drift too far to hear this description and say, hey, wait, that's that's kind of describing the times in which we live. It's true, apostasy within the church. And then finally in 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 2, but there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who brought them, who bought them, and bring on themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. The way of truth, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, will be blasphemed. As we think about it's later than it's ever been, that little boy running around, I don't suggest we run around and say, it's later than it's ever been, get everybody awake. No, we need to be conscious of the times in which we live. We need to be looking around the world and say, in the free world, people are, their freedoms are slowly being taken away. Alignments that are being made geopolitically, we can see the setting stage for last things to come. More aliyah on the part of Jewish people as anti-Semitism increases and Israel finally, uh, unlike during World War II, during the Holocaust, where there was no place for Jewish people to go, God has brought forth a reconstituted Israel so that when there is anti-Semitism around the world, there is a place to go. And it must be there in order for last things to take place. So Israel is there. And finally, within the church, apostasy, false teaching, uh, men and women absorbed in themselves, selfish, uh, not interested in sound doctrine. So, what should we be about doing? What, what should we do in response? First, recognize that it's later than it has ever been. Right now is later than it's ever been. That's a logical statement, but it carries with it great weight. We need to be aware of the times in which we live. We need to be wise, wisdom from the scripture. We need to be looking up 
Uh, one older saint put it this way, we need to be looking up for the catching up because we know that at any moment the trumpet will sound and our redemption draws near. I'm encouraged, believe it or not. I'm not sad. We are more than conquerors through him that loved us. And though countries might be going to pot, so to speak, with despots rising more than ever, as these alignments geopolitically happen, as Jewish people make aliyah because of anti-Semitism, and even within the church, all kinds of false teaching, we can stand fast. And we can preach forward the truth of Jesus Christ. I hope and pray that each one listening knows Jesus Christ as Savior. They know the gospel, that Jesus died for your sins, rose again from the grave. Uh, and that by trusting in him, by turning our life to him, uh, we can have newness of life and be a new creature. Old things pass away. May that be your heart today. Well, it is later than it's ever been. But praise God, one day we'll be by the Savior's side. Heavenly Father, thank you for the truth. We ask you to bless us in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you, Steve, for that wonderful message and answering the question, where do we go from here? Well, friends, we of course know where to go. We know to go to God's scriptures to, that will give us the biblical worldview, to give us the lens to navigate the amazing times that we live in today. Well friends, we're going to take a break and we have some books and DVDs we'd like to share for you and we hope that they'll help you as you study God's Word. We also ask for prayer. We ask that for prayer for our workers in Ukraine. We ask for prayer for the people of Ukraine as they go through the war and the humanitarian crisis that is unfolding. In response to this, we here at Friends of Israel have set up the Eastern European Relief Project to help provide provisions to those displaced by the war. If you want to learn more or to donate, you can find out more on our website. Thank you for listening and we'll see you after. Revelation 15 verses 1 to 4 Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them the wrath of God is complete. And I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire, and those who have the victory over the beast, over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God. They sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy, for all nations shall come and worship before you, for your judgments have been manifested.
You know, when one reads through the book of Revelation, in particular here where Karen is reading from chapter 15, it's a song of victory that the tribulational martyrs one day will sing. Um, it's the song of, uh, of Moses, the servant of God and of the Lamb. And uh, you can read about that song as Moses sang it in Exodus chapter 15, as they rejoiced, as they looked back and they could see how God had protected them and delivered them from the hand of Pharaoh and his army. And as they looked back, they began to rejoice and sing that song of victory. And then Miriam, Moses' sister, and the other women began to take up tambourines and continue uh, to praise the Lord. Well, here in Revelation 15, the martyrs, the tribulational martyrs, one day will sing that song of victory, the victory over the beast and his image. And, you know, I began to wonder, like, what song, what melody would they be singing to the words to this here that we read in Revelation 15? course one day we'll know uh, what melody it is as all those that put their faith and trust in Jesus will be there in heaven and we will know and we will see this but you know uh, we put together uh, this song here for you uh, to encourage you and as we look around our world today and we see how crazy it is we just want you to know as you hear this just let it just remind you that you also can have victory in the lamb as you put your faith and trust in Jesus Great and marvelous are your words, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. The saints, they sing the song of Moses, the servants of God. Welcome back, friends. For our last speaker of the evening, I want to introduce you to a fellow colleague of mine, Larry Mitchell. Larry is our field representative in Alberta. He has also been with Friends of Israel for over 30 years. He hosts Sh Shabbat Shalom, which you can find on our YouTube and Rumble channels. And to finish our evening here tonight, Larry will be sharing what Scripture has to say about the Lord's heavenly throne room. His message is titled, The Throne Room of heaven. Enjoy. The apocalypse of Jesus Christ is divided into three parts. Revelation 119, write the things which you have seen, and write the things which are, and write the things which will take place after this. Revelation chapter 1, John records what he saw on the Isle of Patmos, the things which you have seen. How Jesus revealed himself to John. Jesus identifies himself as Almighty God, the Alpha and Omega, and the risen Savior. The things which are, 
This is Revelation chapter 2 and 3. And this is a record of Jesus' message to the seven churches of Asia. Those seven messages seem to give an overview of seven church ages, from the Apostolic Church, the Church of Ephesus, to the last day's lukewarm church, the Church of the Laodiceans, and to the things which will take place after this. This is Revelation chapters 4 to 22. What takes place after Jesus is finished speaking to the seven churches? This gives an overview of what happens on the earth after the church has been removed at the rapture. J. Vernon McGee, a much wiser man than me, gives us some words of wisdom. J. Vernon McGee says, quote, Years ago, after I recently come to California, I went to see Dr. Gaby Len, who was visiting here. He said to me, how do you like your church in California? I told him it's wonderful. I enjoy it, but there is something strange here. I have since learned that this is true everywhere, but I had not detected it before. I can teach the book of the Revelation to my church and it will fill up on Wednesday nights. But if I teach the epistle to the Romans, I empty the church. I shall never forget what he said in his broken Prussian accent. Brother McGee, you are going to find that a great many of saints are more interested in the Antichrist than they are in Christ. I discovered that he was accurate. The book of the Revelation is not a Christian fortune-telling book. It's all about the revealing of the person and ministry of who Jesus Christ is. And Revelation chapter 4 and Revelation chapter 5 tells us what happens in heaven after the rapture of the church. Revelation 4.1 After these things I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me saying, Come up here, and I will show you the things which must take place after this. After these things. After what things? After Jesus finishes talking to the seven churches. Behold a door standing open in heaven. The scene for Revelations chapter 4 and 5 is heaven. Come up here. Sometimes people have asked me, where is heaven? Well, here we see John says, it's up. And in 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, once again, we see the direction of heaven is up. Then we who are alive remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Heaven is infinitely large. If someone is watching this message in Australia and they begin to look up in heaven, they'll be looking in the opposite direction than someone watching this video in Calgary. Now, I will not be dogmatic, but I believe heaven is straight above Jerusalem. But perhaps the simplest answer is, heaven is the eternal abode of God, wherever that may be. I will show you things which must take place after this. After what things? After Jesus has finished talking to the seven churches. We have entered a period of time which Revelation describes as the things which will take place after this, after Jesus is finished talking to the seven churches after the rapture. Revelation 5, 1 to 3. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strange angel, strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll 
or to look at it. Who is sitting on the throne? The one sitting on the throne is God the Father. There is a cult that denies the Trinity. They teach that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are not three persons, but one person having three names, three titles, three manifestation. Their literature teaches it is Jesus sitting on the throne, but they seem to be willingly ignorant that Jesus comes and takes a scroll from the one sitting on the throne. We read about that in Revelation 5, 6, and 7. And I looked and behold in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain. Who is that? That's Jesus. Having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. Then he came, who came? Jesus came. And he took the scroll of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Jesus is not sitting on the throne. It's God the Father sitting on the throne. This is not the only passage that shows more than one person in Godhead. Genesis 19.24 Then the Lord, and you'll notice the word Lord is all capitalized. It is the word Yahweh or Jehovah. Then Yahweh rained brimstone and fire from on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord, all capitalized, Yahweh or Jehovah, out of the heavens. Here we see Jehovah on earth and Jehovah in heaven, two persons of the Godhead. In Matthew 3, 16 and 17, we see the three persons of the Godhood. When he, Jesus, had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to Jesus. And John saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon Jesus. And suddenly a voice from, came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Here we have God the Father in heaven. God the Holy Spirit coming down like a dove and God the Son being baptized. Three persons of the Godhead. In Isaiah 48, 16, it says, Come near to me. The speaker is God. Hear this. I have not spoken in secret from the beginning. From the time that it was, I was there. And now the Lord God and the Spirit have sent me. Here you see God the Father and God the Holy Spirit sending God the Son. What was in the scroll? It is a title deed to the earth. Man lost his authority to have dominion over the earth when Adam and Eve submitted to Satan. Satan has become the God of this age or the God of the world. 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4. But even of our gospel is veiled, is veiled to those who are perishings, whose mind the God of this age has blinded. A reference to Lucifer. When Jesus takes the scroll, he, as the perfect God-man, takes back the dominion of the earth from Satan. Daniel 7, through 13 and 14. I was watching in night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, a reference to Jesus, coming with the clouds of heaven. He, Jesus, came to the Ancient of Days, God the Father, and they brought him near before him. Then to Jesus was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve Jesus. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? Revelation 5, 4, and 5 give us the answer. 
So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose the seven seals. And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne, and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb, as though it had been slain, having the seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Remember, this takes place in heaven after Jesus has been has finished speaking to the churches on earth. Now, when he had taken the scroll, the tw- four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seal. For you were slain and redeemed us to God by your blood, out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on earth. Who are the 24 elders in heaven? They would seem to be 24 church leaders. Much wiser man than I, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, says this, quote, There has been a great deal of speculation as to who these elders are. The Greek word for elders is presbyteros. By the way, the word presbyterian comes from that. And I am reminded of a story about a little girl who came home from her Presbyterian Sunday school, and her mother asked her what they had talked about. We talked about heaven, the little girl replied. Well, what did they say about it, her mother asked. Teacher said there were only 24 Presbyterians there. Seriously, elders were representatives. We know that Israel had elders, and elders were appointed in the early churches to rule and represent the entire church. Their role was clearly understood by the people in John's day. These 24 elders stand for the total church from Pentecost to the rapture. Therefore, I can say categorically and dogmatically that here is the church in heaven." The early church appointed elders in every church. Therefore, it would only be natural for the church in heaven to have elders. Acts 14.23 says, So when they had appointed elders in every church and prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they have believed. I believe that the elders, 12 of the elders, will be disciples. Revelation 21.14 Now the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. The other 12 will probably be faithful leaders selected from the church age. Perhaps they will be some of the giants of the faith, such as D.L. Moody or Charles Spurgeon. Perhaps a martyr or two from Fox's Book of Martyrs. Perhaps a great missionary or two. They have been redeemed. This seems to be a reference to the church that has been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Galatians 3, 14 and 15. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For his written curse it is everyone who hangs on the tree, that the blessings of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. The redeemed come from every tribe, tongue, people, and nations. Ephesians 2, 11 to 16, talks about the Gentiles being grafted in to Israel, that the middle wall of partition has been broken down. And so when you talk about the redeemed from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation, it would seem to be talking about the church. 
Verse 14, Ephesians 2. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one, has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments, contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from two, thus making peace, that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, therefore putting to death the enmity. And have made us kings and priests to our God. Priests and kings can only apply to the church. For no Old Testament saint, with the exception of Melchizedek, was both a king and a priest. And they shall reign on earth. Remember, they are already in heaven when Jesus takes the scroll from the Father. They speak of reigning on earth and it says we shall reign. It is using a future tense. So the church in heaven is going to come back and reign on earth. Jesus opens the first seal. Now remember, this is after the church is in heaven. Revelation 6, 1 and 2. Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals and heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, Come and see. And I looked and behold a white horse, and he who had set on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. The Lamb opened one of the seals. This is not the wrath of man or the wrath of Satan, but the wrath of God being poured out. John the Baptist's message was to flee from the wrath of God. Matthew 3, 7. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, Brood of vipers, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Those who would argue that God's wrath is not poured out until near the end of the tribulation period seem to be willingly ignorant that it is Jesus who is opening the seals. Those left behind realize the Lamb's wrath is being poured out from the beginning of the tribulation. Revelation 16, or 6, 15 and 17. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of this wrath has come. And who is able to stand? That's not future tense. The wrath is already poured out. In Revelation chapter 6. Since the church must be raptured before God's wrath is poured out, this means the church must be caught up before the tribulation period begins. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, and 10. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Who is a rider on the white horse? Some enemies of sound doctrine have argued the rider on the white horse is Jesus. And they point out Jesus will be riding a white horse when he returns. Revelation 19, 11 to 13. Now I saw heaven open and behold a white horse and he who sat him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire and his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. But the first horseman is not Jesus. He is the Antichrist. The Antichrist is coming, 1 John 2.18. Little children is last hour, and as you heard, that the Antichrist is coming. The word Antichrist comes from two Greek words, Anti meaning another, and Christos meaning anointed one or false messiah. 
The Antichrist is Satan's counterfeit Messiah. Jesus returns as a victor riding upon a white horse. Therefore, it would seem appropriate that the Antichrist would also appear upon a white horse. But the first horseman of the apocalypse cannot be Jesus, because Jesus is the Prince of Peace. When Jesus returns, there will be a thousand years of peace. Isaiah 2, 4. He shall judge between nations and rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hook. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. The Antichrist will come promising peace. Daniel 8.25, he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. Isaiah 28.15 speaks of agreement between the Antichrist and Israel. Because you, Israel, have said, We have made a covenant with death, and with Sheol or hell we are in agreement. When the overflowing scourge passes through, it will not come to us, for we made lies our refuge, and under falsehood we have hidden ourselves. The children of Israel will be seduced into thinking that their covenant with what God describes as death and hell will save them from the war of Armageddon. Peace will be an unattainable promise given by the Antichrist. Isaiah 48, 22, There is no peace, says the Lord, for the wicked. The coming of the Antichrist does not bring peace, but rather war. Revelation 6, 3 and 4, When Jesus opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come and see. Another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, that people should kill one another, and there was given to him a great sword. The identity of the Antichrist cannot be revealed until the restrainer has been removed. 2 Thessalonians 2, 5 to 12. Do you not remember that while I was still with you, I told you these things? And now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he, the Holy Spirit, who restrains, will do so until he is taken from the way. Then that lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion. They should believe the lie that they all may be condemned or damned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure and unrighteousness. When will the Antichrist be revealed? According to the book of Daniel, the seven-year tribulation period begins when the Antichrist confirms a covenant with Israel. Then he, the Antichrist, shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. In context, he's talking about a week of years. Application. We can rejoice knowing the church will be translated to heaven before the tribulation period begins. Number one, the church is already in heaven when Jesus takes a scroll from the Father's hand. Number two, God's wrath begins to be poured out when Jesus opens the first seal. The Bible promised believers will be spared from the wrath to come. Number three, the first seal brings the Antichrist. Number four, the Antichrist cannot be revealed until the restrainer has been removed. Number five, the seven-year tribulation period begins when the Antichrist confirms a seven-year covenant with Israel. There's some other passages that confirm the pre-tribulation rapture. The coming of the Lord is imminent. 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 and 4. But concerning the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly 
The day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor planes upon a pregnant woman, and they should not escape. If the rapture takes place at the midpoint of the tribulation period, then his return is not imminent. He cannot return for at least another three and a half years. If the pre-wrath rapture is true, Jesus will not be able to return for at least another six years from today. If the post-tribulation rapture is true, Jesus cannot return for at least seven years. John has commissioned the church to be his witness until the end of the age, Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. Amen. During the tribulation period, God will raise up two witnesses to preach the gospel, Revelation 11.3. And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth, three and a half years. Why would God raise up two witnesses if the church is to be a witness until the end of the age? Church age has ended. During the tribulation period, God will raise up 144,000 Jewish evangelists to preach the gospel to the end of the earth. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Why would God raise up 144,000 witnesses of the church is to be God's witness until the end of the age? Church age has ended. During the tribulation period, God will send an angel to proclaim the everlasting gospel. Revelation 14, 6 and 7. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Why would God send an angel to proclaim the gospel if he appointed the church to be his witness until the end of the age? Church age has ended. Revelation does not mention the church during the tribulation period. When Jesus was talking to the church, he makes the same exhortation seven times. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. But in the midst of the tribulation, when Jesus addresses the saints, there is no mention of either the church or the Holy Spirit. If any man have an ear, let him hear. There's no spirit. There's no church. The rapture and the second coming are two different events. When the Lord returns for his church, they're caught up to heaven. Then we who are alive remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. When the Lord comes back with the church, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. In that day his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. You do not want to be left behind. Matthew 24, 21 and 22, For then there will be great tribulation, such as not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. You don't want to be left behind. Time is running out. 2 Corinthians 6, 2, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. And you need to put your trust in Jesus in order to escape the wrath to come. John 3, 36, He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Here's a suggested prayer for those who wish to receive Jesus as their Savior tonight. Dear God, I am a sinner. I need forgiveness. I believe Jesus Christ shed his precious blood and died for my sin. I am willing to turn from my sin. I now invite Jesus to come into my heart and life as my personal Savior. 
If you have prayed that prayer, my, I would I would invite you to contact Friends of Israel office and just tell us we've received I've received Jesus as my Lord and Savior. We'd be we'd be happy to follow up on your profession of faith. This is Larry Mitchell. Hello. Thank you, Larry, for that message. Thank you for giving us a glimpse and sharing of the wonderful, amazing thing that is God's heavenly throne room. Such a powerful and awe-inspiring thing indeed. Well, friends, thank you for being with us here today. We hope that these messages encouraged you and challenged you, and we pray that if you enjoyed them, that you would share them with your friends and family. They can be found here on our, on our YouTube and Rumble channels, along with Facebook. We look forward to you joining with us again tomorrow as Rob Gutzleg shares about what's happening in the Middle East and John Plants asks questions, who will be able to stand in the coming tribulations? God bless and see you then. In the segment of the book of the Revelation, Jesus called the things which shall take place hereafter. After. Well, one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the line of the tribe of Judah. And write the things which will take place after this. 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 this.